Hi, this is Father Gordon. Yes. Hi, I was wondering, are you aware that Benedict the Sixteenth rejects Vatican Council One? He does so because he teaches that the Eastern quote Orthodox are inside the Church of Christ, even though they reject the papacy. Okay. Well, could I ask who this is? My name is Brother Peter. Brother Peter. Okay. And where are you from, brother? I'm from New York. Are you familiar with his position in that regard? I'm not. Like, I'm sure you're familiar with the Eastern, quote, Orthodox, who reject the papacy. Eastern Orthodox who reject the papacy? Yeah, this... Yes, yes. I yeah, they they deny Vatican I, and they don't believe in the papal primacy, and so they're, sure. they're heretics and schismatics, according to Catholic teaching. And, and in the ecumenical documents he's put out, and, in, and actually the official teaching of of his church, they consider the bishops and the churches in communion with the Eastern, quote, Orthodox bodies to be inside the Church of Christ. And he's he said this in his book. Uh, he It's taught in Vatican II. It's taught in Dominus Jesus. And that's actually heretical. Well, yeah, I know. We, I mean, we know any, anything that's, uh, you know, contradictory to the teaching of the Church is absolutely that, you know. Um, I mean, I, I, yeah, I'd have to, I'd have to look at that myself. I mean, I know, uh, yeah, I'd have to look at that myself. I couldn't make a... Well, I could email it to you, some of the quotes. He also teaches that Protestantism is not even heresy. No, it is. Absolutely. Yeah. And were you aware that he went into synagogues and took part in Jewish worship? Yes, I that. You, do you agree that he's a heretic? I can't say for sure he's a heretic. I would have to, uh, I can't say that. I can't say he's a heretic. I, can, I mean, the thing is, first of all, I have to look at him as the, as the papacy. He's always, the, we're always going to have a visible head of the church. That's always the teaching of the church. You always have to have that visible head. And there wasn't, you know, there's, obviously there's going to be problems, you know, in the church. There's going to be problems. You know, even with the papacy, you can go to Alexander the Sixth. you know, look at his life and things like that. Um, but I, I don't think the Pope can be stated to be a formal heretic according to the teachings of the Church. Well, uh, that would be my. There, there have point been right there. there have been situations in Church history where we have not had a Pope. Like every time a Pope dies, the chair is vacant, and there have been extended interregna in Church history. And the Church teaches that when you're confronted with a man who's a manifest heretic who claims to be the Pope, that he actually cannot be considered the Pope. He would lose his office automatically. And that's the teaching of the doctors of the church who have addressed the issue, such as St. Robert Bellarmine, St. Francis de Sales, St. Alphonsus. And so according to the proper application of Catholic teaching, he would definitely not be a, a, a pope. And we know he could, Go ahead. Right, right. But who would be able to make that judgment? You need an infallible head to give us that judgment. You wouldn't, and no one could make it because... No one could make an infallible judgment on someone who actually is the pope... Catholics can recognize someone who is not the Pope, certainly to be outside the Church and not the Pope, in the same way that you recognize a pro-abortion politician who claims to be Catholic as outside the Church. Like, do you regard Nancy Pelosi as a Catholic? Absolutely not. By what authority do you consider her outside the Church? She's never been declared. Right, but the very the very fact I mean the the very fact that she's contrary to church uh, to church teaching you know she's got the explicit uh, you know she's made the explicit things and plus the very fact that you've had uh, you know uh, the, uh, in fact our local archbishop you know has spoken of I mean on similar grounds uh, with uh, the former governor out here in Kansas um, um, I can't remember her name off the top of my head but she's now in the uh, she's now in the uh, Kathleen Sibelius yes. yes. Yeah. yeah, so she, he, you know, he explicitly stated she was excommunicated and she couldn't receive communion. Um, well, but, for example, Ted Kennedy, you, you, you're you familiar with him, he died. He was commemorated as a servant of Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, I forgot her. He commemorated as a servant of Christ. Yeah, after his death, they held a, quote, funeral for him. They gave him, quote, communion throughout his life. Mm -hmm. And Nancy Pelosi's never been excommunicated. And so the point is that you take it upon yourself, and you're correct when you do so, to acknowledge her as outside the church by virtue of the fact that she's departed from Catholic teaching. The same principle applies to priests and bishops, and even a man who claims to be the Pope. Benedict XVI is more heretical than Pelosi. Yeah, 
Well, I would say, well, the the other thing too on on, uh, on Nancy Pelosi, if she was if she were to say, um, let, let's say if she wasn't married or whatever, and she were to come to me to receive the sacrament of matrimony, um, and uh, you know she would be considered still under uh, under canon law, and uh, she would be still considered a Catholic in that regard. In which case, you know, she would have to, you know, she would be understood to be a baptized Catholic, you know. And unless she explicitly rejected the faith in that case, or publicly excommunicated, uh, now we can say her practice. She's definitely not a practicing Catholic. That's absolute, you know. Um, and then to say, well, she's no longer Catholic. What for? What? What makes her forfeit the right of being Catholic? Yeah, you'd have to be, you know, and she'd have to be obviously declared uh, in that position. But I guess getting back to the point on the Pope himself. Um, Somebody has to be ahead. Now, I know that in the interim, there's obviously, yes, there's going to be a vacant seat, and that's very obvious, you know. But when we have a pope, though, there's no vacant seat. Well, but get, what you're saying under canon law, she would be considered a Catholic. Actually, she wouldn't, because all heretics and schismatics in canon law are ipso facto excommunicated. And Pope Leo the Thirteenth, enshrining the traditional principle of the Church in his encyclical Satis Cognitum, said that the practice of the Church has always been the same, that when someone departs from the authoritative rule of the magisterium, that person is considered alien to the Church. And it's just like if someone came to you and tried to convert and said, I'm going to become a Catholic, I accept all of Catholic teaching, but I don't accept the Council of Trent's teaching on justification. I don't think you'd tell him that he could become a member of the Catholic Church. Doing so. if you were, yeah, but if you were operating outside the magisterium of the Church, then would you be considered excommunicated? If someone departs from the teaching of the magisterium, someone would be considered excommunicated. I'm not departing from the teaching of the magisterium. The, the teaching of the magisterium requires me to reject someone like Benedict XVI as a heretic. And here's another point, that if he's the Pope, the Catholic Church officially teaches that non-Catholics may receive communion. Do you accept that? Officially teaches? I don't, I don't, I don't see where he is. says officially. It's taught in Vatican II, Orientalium Ecclesiarum number 27. It's taught in the New Catechism. It's taught in the New Code of Canon Law. Well, we know, well, we know that the Vatican Council is not a doctrinal council. So there's no doctrine being taught in it. And, and, and that's even, even uh, Pope, uh, Pope John XXIII would go so far, because he didn't, cause he didn't, in, in, he didn't uh, instigate it on that purpose. And even Pope Paul VI said there's no doctrine being taught in this. And so there's obviously no, it's not a doctrine. I think that's where a lot of the major confusion is. It's you know it's, it's this pastoral council which caused the problems and the confusion in the church. Because there's no doctrine being well. That yeah, that's it's not correct. Um, John the Twenty Third actually never said it was a be a pastoral council. He said that it would reflect the magisterium. But if you if you've read uh, Walter Abbott's version of the which was the earliest version of the uh, second do, second Vatican II documents. Um, he, he writes that in his introduction in that, which was, and Walter Abbott was very proud of putting that one out because he was the first one to put it on the market, and it clearly shows that the, uh, the, the imprudence at the time um, that the church caused as a result of that, because you see all these Protestant, uh, uh, you know, what do you call them, uh, commentaries on there, and, they're, and they, clearly, they clearly show the, the misunderstanding of, uh, of what's going on, you know, and so the, the church has, has been put in confusion. Um, I mean, I, I don't I'm not, I'm not going to say that it's doctrinal, because it's not doctrinal. Well, well, let me just give you a quote in that regard, that you said it doesn't deal with doctrine. Well, Paul VI, in his encyclical Ecclesium Suum, he said that the Second Vatican Council has the task of dealing once more with the doctrine of the Church and of defining it. And actually, at the end of every document, there is solemn language attached to it in which Paul VI, who confirmed the Council, approved, decreed, and established everything by his so-called apostolic authority in the Holy Spirit. And we have maybe 15 or 20 quotes from these post-Vatican II quote popes, which declare that Vatican II is binding, Vatican II is magisterial, you cannot be part of the Church unless you accept it. Go ahead. I've never seen that. It's, 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 not, it's not binding. I mean, what... From where where, do, where would it say? I mean, it's it's imprudent, I'd say, but it's not binding. I mean, I, it doesn't. It never says in there that I have to say the new mass. Well, actually, Paul VI did give a speech in which he pointed out that the new mass was the official promulgated liturgy of the Church. But what I'm talking about right now would be what was promulgated at Vatican II. And in fact, in his closing speech at the Council, uh, Paul VI said, "We decide, moreover." 
that all that has been established synodally is to be religiously observed by all of the faithful. All the constitutions, decrees, declarations, and votes have been approved and promulgated, and he declared this in virtue of his apostolic authority. And as I was saying, at the end of every document, this is also in the Abbott version, you will find this, each and every one of the things set forth in this decree has won the consent of the fathers. We too, by the apostolic authority conferred on us by Christ, join with the venerable fathers in approving, decreeing, and establishing these things in the Holy Spirit, and we direct that what has thus been enacted in Synod be published to God's glory. I, Paul, Bishop of the Catholic Church. That's more formal than you have. Go ahead. Yeah, but it wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, he doesn't declare them defined. I mean, it's, there, I mean, the language has to be very, very precise, and and it's it's very clear that the language. In fact, that's what we learned in seminary. The language is not precise enough to say that this, this this is not defined. I mean, yes, they're defining. They're falling back on this and this, but which means that they are relying upon the church fathers. And when there's a contradiction between them and the church fathers, obviously the church fathers and tradition have to take a precedence over it. Well, the language actually is is solemn. The language and in fact, I've compared it to the past bowls of, for example, the Council of Florence or Vatican I. The language is similar. And here, here's just one quote from Ratzinger on Vatican II. He says, It is likewise impossible to decide in favor of Trent and Vatican I, but against Vatican II. Whoever denies Vatican II denies the authority that upholds the other two councils. And that's why in the discussions of the Society of St. Pius X, one of the conditions for their quote, incorporation into full communion, is their acceptance of the, quote, magisterium of Vatican II. And so it's just, it's undeniable, and I could give you all kinds of, here's actually from one of the notes that was published in the Vatican's newspaper, a full recognition of the Second Vatican Council and the magisterium of John XXIII, Paul VI, etc., is an indispensable condition for any future recognition of the Society of St. Pius X. And just quote after quote after quote, from these guys you would recognize as popes, saying that you cannot reject the council. Like, you you obviously would accept the Council of Nicaea. No, of course. Well, we don't have anything directly from the pope who promulgated that council, Pope St. Sylvester, in which he confirmed the dogmatic definition of Nicaea. Why do we accept that as dogmatic, or why was it accepted as dogmatic at that time? Well, because he was he was their he, he was their president at the thing, and um, but the thing is, I'd have to go. I, and quite honestly, I'd, I'd really have to go through and look at this right now and do my homework because you're kind of catching me off. Well, the answer is that his legates approved it, his representatives signed it, and so that signature. Right, I'd have to look at it my, myself because I always want to. Okay, yeah, that's fine. That's it, but that's a fact that the there's no solemn papal bull from Sylvester promulgating or confirming the dogmatic definition of Nicaea. But because a dogmatic definition or a doctrinal definition was drawn up, and it bore a universal character already because the bishops from all over the world were called, and he, was, he simply confirmed it because his legates signed it, that was enough. And so my point is that what we have from these guys confirming Vatican II far exceeds what we have from popes who confirmed numerous councils in the past, and yet there was no question about the dogmatic status of their decrees on faith. So the point is that if these guys are popes, if Paul VI was a pope, if Benedict XVI is a pope, which he's not, but if he is, the Vatican, Vatican II's decree, for example, on non-Christian religions would be binding. Vatican II's teaching on religious liberty, where it says that religious liberty is the right of a human person enshrined in nature, okay? That is... Go ahead. No, no, no. But uh, no, I, I guess. But the, but the thing that I would be saying is that you know, what what gives you the right to say that those are the right? Those are those are the you know the, those supersede what's always been taught in the church at all times and all places. The same things of learning is always said. Oh, I I believe Vatican II is filled with heresies. I, I reject Vatican II. I'm just pointing out that someone cannot hold the Society of St. Pius X position or the position I think that you sort of are inclined to believe that there are doctrinal problems with Vatican II, but it doesn't really affect the magisterium because Paul VI didn't make it binding. It doesn't hold up. It, it's actually a myth that Vatican II is somehow different in that regard. No, there's plenty of evidence that he promulgated it authoritatively. And in fact, Benedict XVI in his third most recent book, Light of the World, he's talking about 
this issue we were discussing earlier about the true particular churches issue. And he says, and not even a pope can offer an alternative definition of a church. No, he has no authority over that. The Second Vatican Council is binding on him. And so he clearly believes that what the Second Vatican Council said about the church, about the sister churches, quote, of the Orthodox, true particular church is binding. Yeah, but the thing, my, I guess my point would be, see, here's, here's where I'd have a, a qualms, and, I, and I, I would fall back uh, here on my personal conscience, you know, that um, uh, if, 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 okay, this being the case, so I guess the point you're trying to make to me is that we have no pope and the see is vacant, and, uh, I mean, obviously the society position is completely untenable, because if you're going to go that direction, you have to be said in a contest. Right. Because it's completely untenable in their position. And right now, the practical state of a contest, they say that there's a pope. However, in practice, they're, they're not they're not practicing, practicing as if there is. I can, that, that, one, that position is very clear to me. Um, I realize there's serious, serious confusion in the church. And the one thing that's got me hinged is ubi petros ibi ecclesia. You know, that, that, that's the one thing, you know. And, and granted, the, the, the clearest judgments that I can make is to teach always what the church has always taught. And I don't teach anything contrary. Well, you say ubi petra sibi ecclesia, where purity is, there is the church. Right. But that that's the point, that in, sec, in accepting Benedict XVI, you can't believe that. Because he teaches that where Peter is not, there is the church. He right. he teaches... He was, the thing is, is it was he validly elected pope? No, he wasn't. Because according... Why not? Why was he not? Be, because the ch- teaching of the Catholic Church is, and Pope Paul IV made this explicit in his bull cum ex apostolatus officio, that a heretic cannot be validly elected pope, and Benedict XVI taught dozens of major heresies prior to his election. Right, right. But the thing is, is that the the infallibility doesn't protect him before election; the infallibility protects him after. But that's irrelevant because we're not talking about infallibility. We're talking about whether a heretic can be elected validly. But it, yeah, but the thing the thing that we've got to understand also is that everybody we got to face it is at least a material heretic. You know, there's one point where we've come up wrong in our in our teachings. You know, so if that's ever the case, then then the only way you could prove anybody's a heretic is materially. Uh, they, then that's why the church has always given people the. Uh, the opportunity to formally denounce their their material heresy, uh, to, so that they clearly understand where the per- person stands formally. And I know you're familiar with the the terms formal and material. Yes. And, uh, but the thing is, is that was there any, ever an opportunity for him to deny that? If that's what we're saying. Um, and the second, as I can clearly say that I have been a material heretic. I know from the pulpit because I was corrected twice on sermons, and it wasn't. And it was when I was corrected that I realized that oh, you're like you're absolutely right. I, should, I just shouldn't have said it. And it was the way I nuanced. Of course, it's always going to be issues on the Trinity and things like that where it's very easy to fall into heresy. But you know, those things being said, in that case, I could never be elected pope. Not that I'd ever want. To. Well, that that's not com- because a material heretic is actually not a heretic in the dogmatic teaching of the Church. Right. It, they're, they're either Catholics or heretics, and so the material heretic would be a Catholic. Thanks, 16, it's not possible for him to be a material heretic for a number of reasons. Number one, he knows about the teachings he denies. He quotes them and denies them. Number two, you can't be a material heretic on the core mysteries of faith, such as basic belief in the Trinity, that there's only one true God, that Christ is the only truth. You can't be erring in good faith about that. He teaches that we should esteem all religions. We have about 20 quotes on that. He teaches that Islam should be esteemed. Um, he teaches that other non-Christian religions are worthy of esteem. That is apostasy. It's not. It's like someone well, who... He doesn't say that they're one true church. I mean, granted, the language is very, very clearly... Uh, I'm not, I, would, I would say ambiguous in the most generous terms, but I, I would say in the most... Uh, in the most concrete terms, it's 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 very very uh, you know it, it, it's it, it, it's unambiguous actually like he yeah, I mean, he yeah but I mean in that you know because you could say well we're esteemed in what sense you know I'd have to figure well what what sense does he mean esteemed I don't know no he esteems their religion okay right. but if if they were if they were to say yeah that he was if he were to say they were a true religion then you clearly got a statement right there of heresy you know. Um, and so, the, uh, you know, esteemed. I mean, you, you know what's going on in the church. I mean, there's politically correctness and things like that. They're putting they're putting statements down and everything like that to try to make these other religions seem as if they're good. However, not coming out explicitly, and that's the problem in the churches. They're not. They're confusing everybody by not putting down explicit. Well, tell me, are you telling me that they're 
a, a religion, or are you telling me that they're not, uh, that they're that they're the one true religion or not? I mean, you know, that, that's that's the one thing. And they're they're playing a political game rather than they're playing. A well, he teaches that they can be saved in their religions. He teaches that they're pagan saints. He teaches that Protestant religions are a means of salvation. He teaches that um, he agreed with the Lutherans on justification. You probably heard about the Joint Declaration with the Lutherans, right? Yeah, I've heard about that. Yeah, yeah that that teaches that the Council of Trent's Canons no longer apply. That's manifest heresy. There's nothing unambiguous. There's nothing ambiguous about that. It's unambiguous heresy, and it actually teaches justification by faith alone. It not only teaches that it's not a heresy, but it teaches that that's the true doctrine in the annex to the official common statement. And so he's a manifest heretic in like 50 different ways, more than that. And in fact, in his most recent book, Jesus of Nazareth Holy Week, he says that the words of Matthew's Gospel, his blood be upon us and our children, where it's said, he says that's not historically accurate. Well, I mean, it's it's absolutely historic. You would agree that's heresy, right? So, so what what what's the point? I guess you're, I've got to follow you now. What I'm saying to you is, a consistent Catholic, someone who embraces the teaching of the Church, would have to come to the conclusion that he's not a pope, and that's proven. In, in we actually have a website, VaticanCatholic.com. I direct you to that, and it has the documentation. And I'm I'm really glad that you talk to me a little bit about these issues. Um, but it's just, when he's also, getting back to when he esteems the other religions, a Catholic can't esteem a false religion. That's just heresy. I mean, we, can't, we, we can't look on it as a religion, period. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, though, is that, you know, my, my conclusion, I mean, I, I definitely have to look up what, what you're saying, but at the same time, it's, you know, well, then who do we follow? In, all, in other words, the gates of hell are prevailing. That's, that's not true. It's actually the opposite. It, you, your position, if he is good. Where is the church? Though, man? The church resides in the, the remnant of true Catholics who hold the true positions. They're all over the world. They're all over the world. All the people who hold all the teachings of the church and reject her. It's just that so then it's just a church of believers, not a, not not a teaching magisterial church anymore. No, it is. Because well, the church teaches true? even when the chair of Peter is vacant. It's just like during the Arian crisis. When most of the bishops became apostates, did the church still continue to exist and operate in those well, seas? Because the pope never, the pope was never an apostate. No, but there were there were vacancies even during those periods of time. There was no pope, and let's say you were in a, a diocese where the bishop was an Arian. Right, but there is a pope here. I mean, there's there's been an elected pope. You know, now, who? We can say, well, we're we're making a conclusion that there is. You, you know, you're making a conclusion that there is a pope, but. You know, what I can see is it's been validly, you know, the Pope's been validly elected. But here's the thing. If he's the Pope, he's not only heretic, but you have to believe that the Orthodox are part of the Church. He himself, your quote Pope, has said that's the binding teaching. That's what I just quoted for you. In his book, Light of the World, he says that... Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, if you read that book, though, too, there's... he. I think it's in the introduction of that book... Uh, He's not writing. He's not writing as a, as a as a pope. I mean, he's writing as a as a private individual. This is one of the problems with him and Pope John Paul II. Is they, they wrote books as private individuals, and they there was even Pope who was it Pope Clement the twelfth, uh, um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. I, I could be wrong. Is he Clement? Yeah, I believe it was Clement the twelfth who had spoken about how. Uh, uh, the blessed, when they die, they don't see, they don't have the, the vision of God. Uh, John the twenty second. John the twenty second, correct, yeah. correct. Yeah, and uh, and and that they don't have the vision of God. However, you know, he did retract it before he died. Well, but but he, he wrote that as a private individual, but well, not as a. Um, he did. He didn't write that in in the statement as as, uh, as the pope. What, well, what here's that that doesn't work because that wasn't dogmatically defined until the next pope. Pope Benedict. But, how could he, but the thing is, is that a pope can't state something that's incorrect, though. No, but the, I mean, it wasn't dogmatically defined yet. He can't state something that's incorrect. He can't deny a dogma obstinately. Right, that, right but the thing is, is that he can't. He, but he, but he can't lead when it comes to faith and morals, like you're, you yourself are saying. That if when it comes to faith and morals, he is infallible, and so he can't make a statement based on faith and morals and be fallible. Well, he can do it as long as he's not invoking his infallible authority. As long as he's not. Fulfilling the criteria to teach in value. Point, and that's my point with Benedict the Sixteenth is he's not fulfilling the criteria on these uh, on that on this. Vatican II did. 
in the light of the world. No, in the, in the very in the light of the world that you're that you're quoting on, it's saying that this is what he's saying, but he's not. Well, he, not a quote. Here, here's the point. There, are two, there are two issues. One doesn't even concern infallibility. The fact that he's not a member of the church, he's a heretic, and therefore can't be the head of the church. Right, but 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 the the line that you're what you're quoting though that that document is very very important. If you're going to quote it, you, and and you're and you're saying that he's a heretic, you have to show also in that statement that he is involved. In well, yeah, but the light of the world issue is supplementary evidence that he has taught this quote infallibly, or your church has, and that is proven. Well, number one, by Vatican II, because the same doctrine is taught in Vatican II. Well, and where's your church, then, if you say this is my church? The Catholic Church exists in the remnant of true Catholics who hold the faith. Very good, just like the Protestants. The Protestants no, actually, an individual you have... a church of believers, not a church of uh, magisterial teaching. Sir, Benedict XVI and your church deny the visibility of the church. Vatican II says we long for the one visible church. If, if he's the Pope and your position is true, there is no visible church. There is a visible church. I mean, the thing is, is that whether he's saying that or not, I see a visible church. I go to Rome, I see that there's a, uh, there's a chair there, there's a Pope. I mean, the very fact that you're mentioning uh, Benedict the Sixteenth, although you don't acknowledge him as Pope, you're very you're you're very clear to say that he's the one in that in that position, right? Now. You have a guy yeah, who, who you have a visible guy who denies the papacy. So as long as he dresses up in robes, even if he denies the gospel teaches Jews can be saved, teaches the Orthodox are in the Church, denies the papacy, teaches non-Catholics to receive communion. That's all that matters. And see, that's... He teach non-Catholics to receive communion. In fact, he was the one that was calling the bishops together. In fact, he's called a lot of these bishops here in America on the line because of the very fact that they're giving communion to a lot of these parole boards. You know, and so... No, he actually said that... He actually said in his decree that it's, it's up to each person. And so he, but he's, but, but he, the thing is, is that he is, he is giving that at least, you know, uh, at least the freedom. He won't give him. You won't, you, he won't give communion to. Uh, but would you, would you agree that it is the teaching of your church that non-Catholics may lawfully receive holy communion? No, nope, absolutely not. Can I? It's, it's been the teaching of the Catholic. Church. No, it's the teaching you of the. Have to understand what the faith has always been. As we no, it's not. It it's the teaching of the Vatican II Church. Well, I'm in, the, I'm in the, I mean, I'm in the church, and it's post-Vatican II in the, in the, in the timeline, obviously. Um, but the thing is, is that I, I hold to what's always been taught in the church. I will deny communion. I've, den- I've denied communion to people before. But, like, I, I have no problem with it. Well, here's the thing. Are you aware that it's taught in the New Code of Canon Law, in the New Catechism, in Vatican II, and in encyclical documents that non-Catholics may receive Holy Communion? Well, first of all, the the the, uh, the catechism itself is not is not binding. Uh, Actually, he did say it was we're, binding. We're in canon law. Would that say would it say that I, that we are to give communion? It's stated in Canon eight four four point four and Canon eight four four point three. Canon eight four four point three says Catholic ministers. What's that? Catholic ministers may illicitly administer the sacraments of penance, Eucharist, and anointing of the sick to members of the Oriental churches which do not have full communion with the Catholic Church. It's also taught in Vatican II. So you would be equivalent to the Society of St. Pius X in your position, that you claim he's the Pope, but yet you dissent from his official teaching. Well, the thing is, it says it may. You know, he, he's saying that it's... I'm not, I'm not giving communion to anybody. But... And I and I and I can stand on that position, and uh, and not be held accountable. But he's teaching that it is permissible for Catholic ministers to give communion to non-Catholics, mm-hmm. and that that is heretical. And if he's the Pope, that's the official teaching of your Church, which proves that it's false. Mm-hmm. I know that's false. I mean, I'm not. But the thing is, he may. I'm not. I'm not giving communion to anybody. That's not the point. And, I'm not, and the thing is, though, is, it, is this the official teaching or not? I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, what Pope... Uh, I mean, it, it's very clear, though. I mean, if, if you're not going to give communion to, uh, you know, to people who are in heresy... I mean, for me, it's, it's very clear where, where, where the papacy is. That's why I am where I am. I'm not outside the... Our, our position with the society is not, is not the same. I mean, obviously, it would be the same order if we were, because our priests came from there. But the one thing is, for me, and it's always been clear for me, and in conscience I can never violate this, is where the Pope is, that's where the Church is. And I, I'm, I'm not going to I'm not gonna go against it. Your position denies that. Here's why. Because, because he teaches 
that where the Pope is not, the Church is. He teaches that the Orthodox who reject the Pope are in the Church. And so by, by acknowledging him, you are actually saying that where the Pope is not, where people reject the Pope, the Orthodox, there is the Church. And that's, but you're rejecting the Pope. No, I'm not. I'm rejecting... So, you're, so I guess by that same statement, you're part of the Church, because you reject the Pope, too. I reject an anti-Pope. I don't reject any Pope. Well, there, well, there you go. But the thing is, you're in the same camp, though. So you're, you're, you're in the same position as the Orthodox yourself. No, I'm not. By that very statement. Because if you reject the Pope and everybody else rejects the Pope, and the Pope considers them as part of the Church, then, then, then you're part of the Church, too, in the, same, in the same freedom that you're getting. No, the Orthodox reject all the true Popes in history, their full authority, and their magisterial infallibility. I don't. You reject I, this one. I reject okay. these anti-popes who, who teach. He teaches that the Protestants don't even need conversion. Right. Well, but what's the difference, though, then, between rejecting a few popes and rejecting all of them? I mean, it's in... Ba- in, in, in it's very simple, because these guys, according to the teaching of the popes, according to the teaching of the past popes, you must not accept someone like this as a legitimate pope. Pope Paul IV declared in his bull that you that a, the election of a heretic is invalid, and he can be treated as a warlock, a heathen, a publican, a heretic. Okay, that's the teaching of the Catholic Church. And so, adhering to a guy who dresses up as if he's the Pope and denies all of Catholic teaching, that is not fidelity to the papacy. That is fidelity to an anti. Deny all of Catholic teaching. He denies everything. He teaches that non-Catholics can be saved. He teaches that non-Catholics can receive Holy Communion. He teaches that the gospel is, is historically inaccurate. He teaches that Protestants don't need conversion. He denies Vatican I. He teaches that the Orthodox are in the Church. He pr- esteems Islam. Okay. He praises uh, other non-Christian religions. He takes active part in non-Christian worship. He's going to have another Assisi event, which is also apostasy by deed, is condemned in mortality monimus. But you said that you had problems with the Society of St. Pius X's position. But doctrinally, you're the same. Here's, here's why. Because you dissent from the official teachings of Benedict XVI. Dominus Jesus is his official teaching. I mean, the thing is, if, if the Pope were to call me in, let's say, for example, he were to call me in and say, how come you don't give communion to, uh, uh, you know, to... To heretics, you know, how come you don't give communion to non-Catholics? I could say because your canon law gives me freedom not to. No, that's not it, the it, issue. It, it gives me freedom not to because if it says I may, it, it doesn't say I have to. I would agree with that, but that's not the issue. Freedom not to. I would agree with you there, but that's. I would that. never be, and, and in fact, I've been called on the carpet many, many times. But here, here's and that. I've defended myself every single time on the basis of tradition. But he, he and and it's it's never been able to. Stick. But here's they're a, not they're not promoting doctrine. They're promoting confusion. Here's the issue. It's not whether you personally give them communion. If he called you in and he said, well, your name's Father Gordon. Yep. Father, do you um, agree that others may lawfully give non-Catholics Holy Communion? I would say no. Well, then you're dissenting. Because, you know, and, and, uh, and the fact that, you know, that you've stated it, it, and see, the thing is, is that I can dissent from that because it says, I'm, you know, they may. I said they shouldn't. You know, I, they, they can't. Well, see, you're dissenting. You can't dissent from that, because that's the official teaching. Vatican II, the Code of Canon Law, the New Catechism, right. encyclicals. You can, me, you can tell me this, and I, I, but I, I would agree, because I've already been through a lot of these fights already with bishops, you know? And so, you know, well, I'll sit down and tell them, I said, no, I could say that, and I could fall back on all the popes that have always said that, you know? And the, the fact of the matter is, they, they won't go against my position on that. Right. Well, because they be in the church and hold that position. They l- I'm proof that you the, can be in the church. They allow anybody in the quote church unless you. That's true. Right. That's true. But the thing is, if if I if they allow me in the church and I can hold the church's position, and and I but see it's the one thing I can't get around is where the pope is. There's the church, and I know you don't buy that, but I do. In conscience, I buy that. And even if it's like say an erroneous conscience, and I've been looking into this, and I, it's just, there's no there's no position to hold and make me hold otherwise. No, but here's the point. You you're you're not addressing the issue of. Is what is taught in Vatican II, the New Catechism, the New Code of Canon Law, encyclicals, that the official teaching of the Church or not? The Church can't teach error in those all those areas. Okay, that the ordinary and universal magisterium is infallible. Okay, so then which Canon Law do you follow in 1917? The 1917 Code of Canon Law is something that was promulgated for the Latin Church. Okay, 
but I don't accept the 1983 code of canon law. No, no, but I'm just saying you, you follow the 1917 code then, right? I, I acknowledge it insofar as it does not contradict something of greater weight. So are you are you Eastern right, or are you Sedevacantus? I'm a Sedevacantus. I'm a Catholic, but the correct position is to hold that the chair is vacant. And this whole situation is predicted to arise as well. Well, that's the, well. Then, if you got if you if you're holding that the uh, that the seat is vacant, you know, then then who's going to make the the official judgment on that? See, I need I need magisterial. You know, now you're giving me arguments, and that's fine and everything like that. But uh, you know, I do need I do need an authority because myself, I'm not going to dissent. Um, you know, from from uh, from the authority. If, if there's a document that says if anything gives me leeway. Um, just like St. Thomas More, I think we're stuck in those types of times where we're just looking at the, what, what, is the, what does the old say? So then you have to accept Nancy Pelosi as a Catholic. I don't accept Nancy Pelosi. Your, 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 your conclusions are wrong. Then. No. Because I can't, I don't accept it. And, and you say, by what authority do you not accept her as a Catholic? Because of what's always been taught by the church. Exactly. And the church, same church teaches that you must reject you know, his outside. I don't say I must. I go, if, if yes, it does. If called me in and said, why didn't you give communion to Nancy Pelosi? In fact, I would be, if, if I did that out here, Archbishop Nauman, you know, my, my bishop here right now, he would pat me on the back for not giving her communion. I'm not talking about giving communion right now. I'm talking about acknowledging her as a Catholic. If I didn't acknowledge her as a Catholic, well, the thing is, is that you, I could say, well, she's a baptized Catholic. Is she formally, you know, you guys have, they, they have to formally excommunicate her. Not true. That's not Catholic teaching. The traditional teaching of the Church is that people who de depart from the authoritative rule of the magisterium must be considered outside the Church. They, yeah, and they have to be, but the Church has to give them, the, the Church also and has, has, has put as part of their procedures to tell the person, you are in this and this and this. You have, you, you know, just like they do with Martin Luther. You know? And of course he was excommunicated. No, but the very fact that he was given the chance. But what you're saying is that there has to be an actual declaration for someone to consider another person as a heretic. It's not a declaration, but there has to be the, the, the person has to be in formal heresy. The person has to be the, the person coming out. The church has to question that person, and they're not doing that. That's well, actually, no, Saint Robert Bellarmine points out that you can and must reject a manifest heretic as outside of communion before any examination or declaration. And that's also what Pope Paul IV teaches in his bull Cum Ex Apostolatus Fischi. He says, before any declaration, this person is rejected. And the reason for that is that the unity of the Church is such that if it were not the case, let's say you have lax bishops or apostates who don't declare people, as we do today, people who claim to be bishops, and you have someone who rejects the divinity of Christ. Right. According to your standard, you'd have to call him a Catholic until he was declared or warned. That's yeah, ridiculous. Well, and even the 1917 code talks about that. No, it teaches, it teaches that people lose their offices without any declaration. That's what it teaches, Canon 188.4. And it actually cites the bull I'm talking about, Pope Paul IV bull Cum Ex Apostolatus Officio, which says, without any declaration, Catholics may reject these people. Okay, uh, so, so, so going back to uh, Pope John XXII, was he was he excommunicated? No, because what he taught was an error on something that had not been dogmatically defined. It was not dogmatically it's defined. Heresy. I mean, it doesn't matter. It, the immaculate conception was always understood by the church as what was dogmatic. I mean, it was, it was dogmatically defined, but because it always been understood. Heresy. And the thing is, is that everybody understood that on Pope John. Why why did John the twenty second uh, even even come back and make a and 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 recant that before his death, you know, if he didn't know it was wrong. In fact, as you, if you read the Catholic Encyclopedia article on that issue, he, John the Twenty Third, said that he was not making any definitive pronouncement on the issue, and that he was willing to cor correct himself. And furthermore, it's not heresy because heresy. Right, exactly, and that's and so well, there you go. Let and me just finish. Let me just finish. It is contrary to no, it's not heresy because heresy is a denial of an article of divine and Catholic faith, something that has been magisterially taught by the Church. That was not dogmatically defined until the next Pope, in Benedictus Deus, thirteen thirty-six, Pope. Benedict the Thirteenth. Well, Arianism then is any Pope the twelfth believed in Arianism until that was condemned. Say that again. So any Pope can believe in Arianism until that was condemned. Now here's the difference, because there are certain mysteries of faith, as I was saying earlier, it, with regard to material heresy, that must be known and believed by all, such as that there's one true God, that Christ, Christ is God and man. They're called the essential mysteries. Mm -hmm. There, there are other deeper dogmas, such as whether the elect received the beatific vision, 
uh, as soon as they die and are purged or at the end of the world, that's a deeper issue which you wouldn't be a heretic until you've seen a dogmatic definition and contradict it. But with the basic truth that there's one God, that there's a trinity, that Christ is God and man, there's no excuse. Like someone who believes that there are four gods, that person is not a material heretic. That person is just a heretic. Because you, that person does not know what he must know and believe. And that's what Pius X and Benedict XIV taught, that there are certain mysteries of faith which you must know. Absolutely. Not that clearly would say a person is not Catholic. And that's why Benedict XV uh, cannot be a material heretic, because he denies things that every Catholic must know, such as that there's one true religion. Um, but he will say, he will, if you ask him flat out, if you confront him, is there one true religion, he'll tell you yes. Not necessarily, no. Yeah, but uh, but he will. But it, first of all, his other. If you look at the at the, at the forums that he's stating these other things, you know he's he's trying to he's, he's being political and totally imprudent. I believe that. But uh, but the thing is, is that he's not he's not going to go against that. If you if you if you corner him and you ask him the question, he's not going to go against that. Well, he is actually, and furthermore, like let's say John Kerry has claimed that he's personally opposed to abortion, but that he doesn't impose his view on others. So someone can claim to believe in something, but if they contradict it many other times, it doesn't matter. That's why Pope Pius VI said in Octorum Fidei, a constitution, he said that heretics always contradict themselves. And so if they teach heresies, it doesn't matter if they state the truth some other times. And so if, even if Benedict XVI did say there was one true religion, and I bet you if he were questioned, he wouldn't. He would give some uh, some convoluted heretical answer. But it doesn't matter, because he says things that deny that. Namely, he esteems false religions. And in fact, in his book, Truth and Tolerance, there are quotes where he he clearly contradicts the truth that there's one true religion. Well, can I ask you this? Where do you, where, where do you go for concessions? To a priest ordained in the traditional right. Mm-hmm. But does he have faculties from a bishop? And I, and I guess you're going to go back to... The church supplies jurisdiction. And what... And what, and what I, no, but it can't supply for validity, though. Yeah, it can. No, it can. Not, not, it, could, it could supply... But the church is not supplying for jurisdiction in this case. No, the church does supply jurisdiction. And, in fact, that's the traditional teaching of the church and the authorities who have addressed that. But it supplies in what sense? I mean, it, it can't supply... For these... These are these are, are, are sacraments that receive the... I mean, like, say, for example, a priest who's been, uh, you know, it, it'll supply in certain circumstances in cases of emergency where you have a, uh, you know, a, a guy who's dying and you have a priest who's been, uh, you know, he's been defrocked, uh, he's suspended, and he can, he can actually uh, hear confessions because you're, you're talking about a situation where a person's in danger of death. You know, and in that case, the, the, the church will supply. In common error, the church can supply. Um, but the thing is, is that... It can't supply for validity, you know, and that's one of the situations that I think you'll find yourself in and also the society is in, you know, and those are things I can't get around. Well, that that's actually not not true. The Church does supply, it supplies in doubt of law, probable doubt of fact, supplies in common error, um, and in fact, in the first millennium of the Church, a distinction was not even made between validity and jurisdiction. But it is now, though. It's been clarified. Just like you mentioned about the dogma before John the 22nd, you know, it wasn't stated before and then it's stated afterwards. Well, it's clearly stated now. Right, but we're talking about a principle that that operates that, I agree, church couldn't supply if you have someone who has not been ordained in a traditional right no, of the but church. That, but see, that there's two sacraments that require both ordination and they, 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 supply, they, they require order and jurisdiction. They require both. And, uh, and the two sacraments are confession and matrimony. Both have to be fulfilled, you know. And uh, the, the other ones are just are, are exceptions. They're not. Well, what I'm saying is, you don't have jurisdiction. I do. No, you don't. You you don't have it from a Catholic bishop. You. Who? Archbishop Nelman. Th- that's a guy who believes that non-Catholics can be saved. He's and connected with the Pope. I mean, uh, he's I, not I'm connected not, I'm with not the Pope. No problems in the Church. I'm just saying that you know, there's there has to be a visible head and there's visible members. That's the visibility of the Church. No, it actually That's one of the four marks of the Church. It has to be visible. No. Well, here's the thing. Melman accepts Vatican II, and Vatican II teaches that the Church is not visible. Here's what your Church teaches. John Paul II. But you, but you believe it though. I believe, I believe what? It's, it's visible. 
I know the church is visible. What I'm saying to you is your church is not visible. Here's why. Well, your church isn't visible because you're you're talking about the remnant of people. Uh, That's like I'll, I'll give you the proof for what I'm saying. John Paul II, Ut Unum Sin, number seven, what Melman would accept. And yet almost everyone, though in different ways, longs that there may be one visible church of God, a church truly universal. Okay, so according to yeah, well, Melman... We all, we all want that. We all, we all want No, it exists. We don't long for it. It's here. Okay. Your church. Long, they're saying they long for it. That's what's wrong. Right. Meaning it doesn't exist that's yet. You just said you just, you just said that's what that's what they wrote. That that's what John Paul II taught. That's your yeah, church. Yeah, we all we all long for one true universal church. But if if one exists already, we don't long for it. It are, it's already here. It's one of the marks of the church. Well, we 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 long that all men be members of this church. No, that's not what he's saying. Yeah, but the thing is, is that that's. But you can understand that that's that's what could be understood from. It. That's not what he means. Here's another quote on the same right, topic. Right. Here's another quote. Homily, December 5th, 1996, speaking of non-Catholics, when we pray together, we do so with the longing that there may be one visible church of God, a church truly universal. Okay? So according to Melman, there is no visible church yet because you're still longing for unity with heretics. And actually, according to Melman, where Peter is not, there is the church. Where the Orthodox are, there is the church. He's in communion with the Orthodox. And so you have you have the robes, but you don't have the faith. I don't have the faith. And you also dissent from what your church teaches, as I pointed out, with non Catholics receiving Holy Communion lawfully. Because yeah, the thing is you're elevating to doctrine to church doctrine what isn't doctrine and what and you're elevating to dogma what isn't dogma and that's why you hold your position. You know, I mean we're we're in very, very confusing times and I realize that right now. You know. Um the thing is, is that there's there's certain there's certain dogmas that I can't get around. So basically, Benedict XVI is wrong about what he considers binding church teaching. Well, the, the, what, what the church teaching has always been taught, but what's, what's always been taught is what we always have to believe. His job, the job of every pope, is to pass on what's been given to him, so he passes it on to the next generation. You know, and it's, and and that's you know, that's one of the problems right now. It is not being passed on. You know, and and it's being it's being convoluted and confused. He's not, I'm, I, you know, I'm going to say he's the pope. You know, no, but is he wrong when he says that Vatican II's and Dominus Jesus's teaching that the Orthodox are in the Church is binding? And that's in and that's in that uh, that document that you just stated. But the the, the the document that he's stating it in is not a binding document. But is he wrong? In in that you could say yes. Okay, so it's you're. Doc, but it's not a binding document. <laughs> No, the documents he's referring to would be binding. And and so that just proves my point, that you dissent, your own, quote, Pope, the one you think is Peter, you dissent from what he says is binding. There's no doubt. Well, there's no doubt in my mind he's the Pope. No, I can tell you, infallibly, he's not the Pope. Infallibly. Infallibly, he is. Well, I'm telling you, you're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. I know, but that's... And, and that's you're also wrong about jurisdiction because the church you don't understand yeah, that's supply jurisdiction. I mean, I've got, I've, I've Do you got, want to debate me on it? Well, look, I've got a, I've got to save souls, and I know you've got you've got your agenda and your and your and your thing like that, you know. But I'm not I'm not I'm not going to get into this argument. I mean, I really don't have the time right now. You know, I'm pretty busy. Let me ask you this: Do you believe non-Catholics can be saved? I, I don't believe non-Catholics can be saved. I, don't, I I believe that you have to be a member of the Catholic Church to be saved. So. Were you are you aware that Archbishop Lefebvre taught in his book that souls can be saved in a religion other than the Catholic religion? I don't follow Archbishop Lefebvre. I I know. I'm just saying was that heretical when he said that? When he said that the Catholics can be saved outside the church. When he said souls can be saved in a religion other than the Catholic religion. No. I don't believe that. But is that heretical? I would say, yeah, you can't you can't uh well you can't you can't believe that anybody can be saved. They can be saved by the merits of the Catholic Church, like say you're considering situations of baptism of desire and baptism of blood. Uh those are only given in death and in rare circumstances. So you do believe that non Catholics could be saved, quote, by the merits of the church, even though they don't have the faith? Only by the merits of the church. So you do believe non Catholics can be saved? No, I b I don't believe that. I because you you do you believe in baptism of desire and baptism of blood? No. You don't. Okay, well, there. I'm very familiar with the issue. Well, right, right. So then, so then that's that's the thing, and the, and the church has always taught that. It hasn't always taught that. Yeah, Saint, Saint Thomas Aquinas. Uh, Saint Thomas, Saint, Thomas. A, Saint Thomas Aquinas did teach that. He also taught that Mary was not immaculate. 
Okay. Yeah, I know, but the thing is, though, is, he, but he didn't teach her that she wasn't immaculate. What he said, he was going back. He had actually a uh, um, a medical error on that. You know, his he he thought because uh, according to him, he thought that conception of the he says when the human soul was infused, that's when Our Lady was immaculate conceived. But he understood as conception being kind of like a, a plant growing in a in a garden where the seed is dropped and the seed is dropped in the womb, and then of course it begins it begins this plant life. Then the soul is quickened and it becomes hum, it becomes animal life, and then the soul is quickened and becomes a human life. But at the moment that the human soul was there. He he said that that's what Our Lady was was conceived at that moment. So he never denied the Immaculate Conception. He only had it medically wrong because he didn't have the the uh, the, the, the biological knowledge that we have now. But if you were to tell him, if you were to ask him today what he was teaching in that thing, he says when the human soul was infused in our Blessed Mother's when she was Immaculately Conceived. So he never denied the Immaculate Conception. Well, he did actually. I'm familiar with what you're talking about. He, he never, no, he never denied it. I, I have the quotes for you. I could, I could yeah, give them to. Yeah, I've, I've read it already. I've had to quote it to a few uh, Feniites. You know? no, um, yeah, and but well, did you know that? So you would agree that 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 idea, the Aristotelian idea of of when the soul was infused, that he held, you would agree that's erroneous. When he when he says that a, I would say at the moment, but. It, what he said at the at the time that the soul, that the human soul was there. As soon as at the very beginning, the human soul is Our Lady was conceived immaculate. But do you do you agree that that's an erroneous view of of conception? If on the on the biological level and on the physical level, yes. And how about on the theological level? That the, the human theological level, absolutely not. I mean, if if the if when the soul is infused, which is at the moment of conception, when the soul is infused. That is that is when Our Lady was immaculate. But is it is it erroneous in your view to hold that the human body grows and begins to exist, and then sometime later, maybe a few weeks later, the soul is infused? No, no. It's in the, the human soul is infused at the moment of conception. That's that's the biological fact. So so you would agree that it's erroneous to hold that the human body begins to grow, and then the soul may be infused a few weeks later. I, I don't believe that. Do you, so therefore you would agree that that's theologically erroneous? It's not theological. It's a biological. Right now you're talking about uh, both metaphysically and physically is what you're talking about. No, but it also deals with theological well, issues. Well, yes, it touches on it, but it, but the thing is, is that he never denied the theological part of it. That's the, that's the point. He never denied the theological No, I'm not talking about him right now. I'm talking about... But that's, but, but that's who I was talking about. But I'm talking about that, that very... Impressive. No, but I'm trying to understand your position. That is your position that it's theologically erroneous to hold that the human body begins to grow, that it's the matter is infused, and then the soul is infused maybe a few weeks later? I'm not talking theologically. I'm talking biologically. Yeah, I'm asking you theologically. No, well, if it's wrong biologically, it's wrong theologically, because well, the thing is, it, yeah. But the thing is, is it the? Uh, what, but I'm going back to St. Thomas because that's the point that we're trying to correct here. Is that's what we're looking at, and that's why we're making this distinction right now, is because we're talking about St. Thomas, and uh, and St. Thomas had biologically he didn't understand what was going on at that point, but the very fact that he said when the human soul was infused, that's what we're looking at. When the human soul was infused, it was immaculately conceived. That's the, but and and so if he had it biolog if he understood biologically what was going on and metaphysically what was going on at that point he would have clearly said that the immaculate conception that the, yes he believed in the entirely the immaculate conception. Now he held that her soul was um, was stained with original sin for a certain period of time. That's just a fact. But not 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 when the human soul was infused though. That's what he said. What he said was not consistent with what was later promulgated. He had a convoluted view of conception when it's compared to what has been later dogmatically defined, and his position was wrong. And in and, fact, okay, so so Saint Thomas, uh, I, we can just take the sum and chuck that. I didn't say that. Well, it's, then what, then what what, is, what relevance does that have? You're trying to say that see Saint Thomas was wrong on that point. You, you, Therefore, he can be wrong on every other point. What I my point was, you cited Saint Thomas to prove that baptism of desire is a teaching of the church and my point is that he's not infallible. Okay, he he you're was right, you're right, which means that, that, that all, all his all his writings can be questioned. All his writings would have to be subjected to the higher authority of the church. In other words, they are to be given respect and I, and I read St. Thomas a lot. But if we're confronted with something of greater weight that contradicts him, and in fact St. Thomas himself 
says that we must discard the opinion of a doctor when we are confronted with the judgment of the church of the church and so adhering to saint thomas actually requires us to go with the teaching of the church and not with what he said but the fact is the church is not always saint alphonsus saint alphonsus also saint alphonsus is, was an incredible writer but he wasn't infallible but, but the church says you can even trust the opinion the magisterial teaching of the church talks about saint alphonsus you can trust an opinion and you cannot and you will not err it's talking about his his moral theological opinions are safe. The yeah. the church also says Saint Gregory Nazianzen in the Breviary mm -hmm. that that there's nothing in his writings which any uh, reasonable person could call into question. Yet he denied baptism a desire. Okay, so we can't. Do you, but the thing is, is that Saint Alphonsus was the one that's very. I mean, he's very very clear on his on his position. Saint Thomas is clear on his. Saint Gregory Nazianzen. Uh, I'd have to read Saint Gregory Nazianzen on that one. But the thing is, is that you'd have to have if the, the, the unanimous, uh, the, the unanimous understandings of the doctors uh, is, is how you have to take it. Because whenever, whenever you have a unanimous quote on the church fathers or the church doctors, you can consider it infallible. You know, and if it's not unanimous. That's the point. It's, it, the church fathers are not unanimous. That's a myth that's uh, promulgated in Society of St. Pius X circles and fraternity of St. Peter circles. Excuse me that the fathers of the church were unanimous in favor of, quote, baptism of Tsar. It's not true. In fact, the majority of the fathers of the church rejected the idea. That well, I, I would like to see, uh, because, what, no, not, not at all, because St. Saint, Saint Ambrose and St. Saint, uh, Saint Augustine actually promoted it, because St. Augustine wrote a letter to St. Ambrose about Valentinian, the emperor, who's going, not an emperor, but he was, uh, he was one of the governors in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the Roman Empire. He was on his way to receive baptism, and he was killed by robbers. And uh, St. Augustine writes a letter to St. Ambrose lamenting his death. St. Ambrose says, no, absolutely not. His desire for the very sacrament was his reception. He says, did, did he not get what he desired? His letter's ambiguous. In fact, I've, well, I've, I've written on the topic. Yeah, but see, then the, the thing is, you can clearly see, though, he was, he was, he was uh, telling St. Saint Saint um, Saint Augustine what he was actually telling him about uh, baptism of desire. So here you have a, another, uh, another doctor and father of the church, two doctors and fathers of the church, uh, you know, writing each other on this. And you, you also have St. Ambrose saying that no man goes to heaven without the sacrament of baptism. And he didn't say that. Hold on a second. He didn't say that Valentinian was saved without baptism. He didn't say that anywhere. He said. He says, but his his uh, his desire for the for the sacrament was the reception of it. So, if I'm, of course, I'm paraphrasing because I don't have the quote in front of me. Uh, right in that very in that very text, he says that not even martyrs are crowned if they're catechumens. Well, what about what? Okay, what about uh, Saint Emeritiana? She was a catechumen, and she was a martyr, and she was uh, she was at the uh, at, at the grave site there of Saint Agnes, her cousin, and she'd just been killed. Saint Emeritiana was a catechumen at the time, and uh, she was killed. You know, that's in the that's in the breviary as well. So Saint Emeritiana was a canonized saint who was never baptized by water. Well, first of all, the term catechumen doesn't necessarily mean unbaptized, because yeah, well, hold on a sec. Hold on a sec. Saint Saint Ambrose said that his catechumens still underwent instruction after their baptisms, and so it, it doesn't say anywhere that she was unbaptized. And in fact, and in fact, the breviary is not infallible in all of its entries, and that's admitted by not only countless authors, but it's the Roman Martyrology, etc., have been revised by numerous popes. I mean, there are all kinds of papal teachings on right. corrections. Okay. Well, before we go any further, let's just, you know, I'll just make an analysis of who we've blown out of the water, of who we can't trust. Anymore. I didn't say we can't, we can't trust. No, no, but I'm, I want to be honest about this, you know. Like, we can't quote, I uh, can't quote St. Thomas because he's questionable. I can't quote St. Alphonsus, he's questionable. I can't quote St. Augustine, I can't quote St. Ambrose, you know, they're all questionable. Saint, I can't quote any... Can I respond to that? I okay. can't quote Denzinger because Denzinger believes in baptism. Denzinger is a collection of documents. Any teaching of the church. I mean, I'm, not, I'm left with very, very... Sir, little. sir, let me respond to that. that. Let me just follow you, Brother Peter. I think you've got the truth. Hold you on know, a second. You're the only one that's right. No, what you know, I'm saying to you is that St. Ambrose contradicts you. He teaches that no man is saved without water, but so does St. Alphonse, St. Yeah, Augustine. Absolutely, absolutely. So does St. Augustine. But they say certain circumstances. But and that's why we, don't, we go by what the church has taught, and the church has dogmatically defined that if anyone shall what? say that the sacrament of baptism... As referring to the sacrament, if anyone shall say that baptism is not necessary for salvation, let him be anathema. Absolutely, and I, I absolutely agree with that. You because don't. The thing is, is that baptism of blood and baptism of desire are part of baptism. They're, they're not. They're not. They're not of water, but they're baptism. Are they the sacrament of baptism? 
They are not the sacrament of baptism. Right. But they, yes, they work sacramentally, but there's no indelible mark left on the soul. Right, it's not a sacrament. Those things entitle them. What about the, uh, we had 40 Roman soldiers who were out on the lake, you know, and, and one of them apostatized. And then one of the Roman soldiers who was not a Catholic and who was not baptized, he dropped his spear, went on the frozen lake and died with all of them. And he's considered those 40 saints, and he's one of them, and he wasn't baptized. The, the, the church has never said they weren't baptized. And in fact, one of them, according to the martyrology, let me answer. Okay, the church has never said they weren't baptized. And one of them, according to the martyrology, cried out in a loud voice that he was a Christian because he was already baptized. That's why. And he didn't say I'm a and Christian. It, yeah, he did. In fact, I have the quote here. In fact, we've addressed these objections. This is uh, the Roman martyrology, September 9th. It's Sebastian Arminius, St. Severian for frequently visiting the 40 martyrs. So it shows, actually this entry shows, that the martyrs were visited by saints, so they could have been instructed and baptized. They could have. And then, and then it goes on to say that one of them cried out with a loud voice that he was a Christian because he was baptized. And, and see, here's the point, that there's nothing, all the stuff that you're bringing up can be addressed and and answered and refuted but what i'm quoting but your points can be just <laughs> no no here, here's the point are, are the catechumens part are unbaptized catechumens part of the faithful unbaptized catechumens part of the faithful no okay well it's dogmatically defined pope innocent the third that there's one universal church of the faithful outside of which nobody at all is saved okay so, you, so does that include catechumens then unbaptized catechumens you just admitted they're not part of the faithful well you just said they are no, I didn't. I said a catechumen yeah, could be. You just said that they are, though. An unbaptized catechumen. No, I said they're not part of the faithful. Well, then, but that, but that's what that's what I'm saying. Saint Emeritiana. <laughs> no, sir. She's a catechumen, and she's not part of the faithful. So you admit that unbaptized catechumens are not part of the faithful. You already admitted that, right? Unbaptized catechumens are not part of. The right, and it's dogmatically defined that there's no salvation right. for anyone who's not part of the faithful. Well, if you hold, I got an appointment right now, brother. So, well, I gotta go. My uh, listen, I would check out our website, VaticanCatholic.com. Mm -hmm. Yes, but I would strongly suggest, Father Peter. I know your your ideas are very, very strong. And I know this is confusing times, um, but, um, but I'll be praying for you. You know. Lord, well, I would tell you in charity that you like you won't save your soul in your present positions. I know. Well, I will tell you in charity as well that you will not save your soul in your presence. It was, you're in communion with a guy who rejects the whole papacy. Well, I, I'm not going to go any further on this, but but uh, but you've got your position. I've got mine. And, and, I'm in truly good conscience, and I have no qualm of conscience. No. And and you would dissent from what Benedict XVI officially says. No, I won't. So what he's wrong. What he says is binding. I'm he, sorry, but I got to go. Okay. okay. All right. All right. Bye. Bye. -bye.